Among the many former British colonies that have grown into some of the world's most developed countries, Australia is unique. Specifically, its economy has developed into something unlike that of any other, and a big player in the story of that economy is China, for better or worse. To understand China's role in Australia and the problem this poses down under, one has to start in a very different place, the United States. Always goes back to the Yanks, doesn't it? You can't have anything without the Yanks taking over. <laughs> if it were not for the US, Australia might not exist. Prior to the American Revolutionary War, Britain would primarily send their prisoners to the American colonies when sentenced to transportation. Once the colonies became the independent country of the United States, Britain needed to find a new place to put their convicts, and for that, they chose what is now Sydney. The first fleet of convicts who arrived in Botany Bay were the origins of what is now the country of Australia, and they might not have made the long trek to there if not for the founding of the United States. So there we go. Uh, Australia, you are Australia, and you are su fairly successful and fairly rich, all because of the United States. I hope that makes you feel good. Um, <laughs> Beyond it's probably this, true, though. The history of Australia and the history of the US are eerily similar and interlinked. The two countries' foundings are offset from each other by 180 years, but parallel significantly. Australia is almost the exact same size as the contiguous United States and even has similar dimensions to the US. Both nations include similarly diverse landscapes and climates, and both started in the East. They then each expanded west, taking over indigenous land, largely fueled by the discovery of gold and its subsequent mining. On a slightly different subject here to what the actual video should be about, isn't it interesting? It makes sense why uh, the United States was first kind of the Brits and the and the Europeans first kind of took over from the east. But it's interesting why Australia was taken over on the east side rather than the the west side. Uh, you think obviously distance that's what i'm thinking from 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 great britain united kingdom um distance wise has anyone thought about that why was australia first settled in the east rather than the west while the scale is obviously quite different both nations were quite isolated by distance to the european world although close to a number of other european colonies both nations started with their small British populations, and then grew primarily through immigration from English-speaking countries, secondly through immigration from non-English-speaking European countries, and thirdly through immigration from the rest of the world. They even share the same- They definitely used China as the rest of the world, didn't they? ...same story in the founding of their capital cities. They each built a planned city in a central location between their two major population centers as to not favor one over the other. The similarities go on and on, but the point is that Australia and the US were largely dealt the same cards, but got vastly different results. <laughs> the US quickly developed into one of the most politically, economically, and socially powerful countries on Earth, with a population well over 300 million. Australia, however, never grew into more than a small regional power with a small population of just 25 million. Now, Australia is no doubt a highly successful nation. It's among the world's most wealthy countries, the world's most developed countries, it has one of the world's lowest poverty rates, and is one of the highest scoring in the World Happiness Index. What the country is definitively not, though, is a superpower. What That's an interesting point, um, because, you know, as I've learned about Australia, it's well developed in, in most of the regions, but obviously you've got the area in the middle which is tough to live in. You've, you've, there, there's people that have found a way to live in the, in the hot areas, in the middle and north. Um, you know, for example, like Cuba PD, where they actually build their houses inside the caves. Um, but on a whole, you need, the, you need to live on that coastline, by like Sydney, Melbourne and whatnot, um, to get the, the cool air from, from the sea. Um, whereas I think the United States has a lot more habitable, habitable areas. But it is still interesting that... Hello, Pix. Um, it's still interesting that actually... Australia is not a superpower. Well, I don't know if you guys in Australia think you're a superpower, but you're not a superpower. And it's strange with the economy, um, with the resources you've got, for example, that you are not a superpower. It's um, whereas, whereas obviously the United States, sadly, is. Well, you can never forget the role of pure chance, 
Given the similar starting position of both countries, the first thing one has to look at for a reason behind this is Australia's geography. Despite their similar sizes, what differentiates Australia from the US is its desolation. About 35% of the landmass is considered desert, which generally cannot sustain large population centres. There are, of course, exceptions to this, most notably in the Middle East, Abu Dhabi. where huge cities such as Dubai, Buda, Dubai, Doha, and Riyadh sprung up in the middle of deserts, but each of these largely developed as a result of oil booms in their respective countries. While the deserts of Australia do have oil deposits, none of these are at a similar scale to those of the Middle East, have not been significantly exploited, and, in addition, it's largely Perth, on the western coast, that has emerged as a hub for oil, rather than an inland city. A side fact, I'm pretty sure that sort of area as well is um, is good for lithium. Uh, it, it's a yeah, it's a good area for lithium mining. So rather than the oil, get the lithium instead. With limited arable land and a harsh climate, the inland of Australia just isn't conducive to most human life. This results in a fairly striking population density map. So yeah, just all by five the major sea. population centres have emerged: Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. Each of these is directly on the coast. The largest city in Australia that's not directly on the coast, in fact, is Canberra, the capital, which has a population of just 400,000 and was a planned city, meaning its development cannot be a perfect indicator for the viability of inland life in Australia. Even then, it sits a mere 70 miles or 115 kilometers from the coast. If you're talking about population centers that are significantly offset from the coast, in the outback as it's called, the largest would probably be Alice Springs a Northern Territory town of just 24,000. This desolation can be further exemplified by the country's road network. I've heard of Alice Springs. I have heard of Alice Springs, but if you think this is a, this is a town of, what's it say, 24,000 people, that's nothing. I live, I've just got a cat climbing up my leg. Um, I live in a place called Eastleigh, just, just above Southampton. And uh, ours is about 110,000. And ours is a small town. Um, so to think 24,000 is nothing. And it is basically in the middle of nowhere. You know, the, the distance you have to go to get anywhere in Australia. Um, yeah, this is certainly a town in the middle of nowhere. The primary highway linking the population centres of Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide to Perth is just a single two-lane road traversing the southern coast of the country. The same is the case for the Stewart Highway, which... Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Pixie and Astro are still not friends. They are still not friends, so uh, Pixie just had a go at him. Serves as the primary link from the south coast to the north coast of the center of the country. It, too, is just a two-lane road. What this all means is that much of Australia's land just doesn't lend itself to the development of large-scale human settlements, leaving it fairly empty. Australia's vastness served a crucial role in developing it into one of the world's wealthiest economies, though. The country is now the world's largest exporter of minerals. It has huge amounts of coal, iron, lead, diamonds, gold, uranium, and more, mostly in its vast open outback. That means that the primary economic activity in Australia's interior is mining, and with natural resources making up a majority of the country's exports, it were these minerals that played a major part in growing Australia into a wealthy economy. This also ties into the whole climate, the climate change and, and the whole COP26 situation where, let's be honest, you can sort of understand why the, the PM, Scott Morrison, for example, doesn't want to let go of using the coal and, and, and these these fossil fuels because they've got so much of it. You guys have got, in Australia, have got so much of it. And it is what has made your country relatively rich. Um, so it's hard to see past that. They also cemented who Australia's economic partners would be. Nearly 30% of Australia's exports go to China, primarily driven by China's significant demand for minerals. China, in fact, in the number one spot, buys more from Australia than the number two, three, and four countries combined, Japan, the US, and South Korea. Beyond just Chinese companies buying minerals from Australian mining companies to use in their factories, there are also sizable amounts of investment coming in from Chinese companies. Overall, it's safe to say that the Australian mining sector would not be what it is without China, but Australia also relies on the billion people up north to act as customers for another crucial aspect of their economy. 
it's a tricky one, isn't it? It's clearly a tricky situation. I think everyone around the world knows China. There's something just a little bit dodgy going on. Um, and that's generalizing, obviously. That is generalizing. Um, but spanning from the kind of communist days. Um, but if the problem is, if they are your biggest, biggest uh, exporters... You know, it's almost hard to say no, isn't it? It's hard to say no, because they're the ones willing to give you all this money, which helps your economy, helps your your people. Education. As strange as it might sound, universities, which in most cases are nonprofits, form a sizable part of the Australian economy, as Australian universities are some of the most successful in the world at attracting international students. The country is home to about 875,000 international students wow. across all types of schools. Now, of course, remember, the entire population of Australia is only about 25 million. That's a million. big percentage. What that means is that in the entire country, one out of every 28 people are international students. Of these international students, the highest proportion by far are Chinese at 30%. That represents a quarter of a million Chinese students studying in Australia. On the flip side, that means that at any given time, one out of every 5,000 Chinese people are studying in Australia. Within universities, Chinese make up 10% of the average student body. However, considering they tend to cluster together, certain universities have far higher proportions. At UNSW, the proportion is 23%. At University of Sydney, it's 24%. And numbers are similar at other hotspots. All in all, these Chinese students contribute more than about $10 billion a year to the Australian economy. This is just kind of showing that it's almost like Australia really is relying on China. And, and you may not, when you're living it day to day, it's one of these things you may not realize, um, but these sort of statistics are showing that actually they are a big, big part of Australia, China is, and you are relying on them for money mainly, I suppose, yeah. There are also plenty of other sectors that play a part of China's huge economic influence in Australia, such as tourism, manufacturing, services, and more. Given how much the two economies are interlinked, therefore, as China has risen, so too has Australia. This link to the success of one of the biggest economic success stories ever has helped Australia earn an impressive record. It has gone 28 years since 1991 without a recession. Hmm. While the rest of the world struggled through the wow. Asian financial crisis, the collapse of the dot-com bubble, and the Great Recession, Australia just kept on going with quarter after quarter after quarter of economic growth. <sighs> By most measures, in modern history, no developed country has ever gone such a long period without a recession. That's insane. Now, I don't think myself, I'm 31, I don't think I've properly seen a recession in that uh, enough to affect me or for me to notice it. Um, but no recession like from the 60s. That's insane. No wonder why, you know, no wonder why you're doing so well um, as a country financially. But this all, of course, has a flip side. Such heavy economic reliance you rely on them. that politically Australia doesn't always agree with is dangerous. An Australian-Chinese trade war would certainly cause a lot more damage down under than up north. At the same time, there are quite a few efforts by China to influence Australia. China has made plenty of attempts to tip politics in the country in their favor. As one small example, Chinese Communist Party run or affiliated WeChat accounts, a popular social network in China, released posts critical and mocking of Australian politician and current Prime Minister Scott Morrison in the run-up to the May 2019 Australian election. Beyond that, the Chinese government has been known to unofficially sponsor certain pro-China, ethnically Chinese candidates for various Australian offices through a variety of methods. In media, China has been known to impart vast control over Chinese language outlets in Australia and responds harshly to criticism through defamation lawsuits and more. On university campuses, the Chinese Communist Party is known to have vast amounts of influence, with accusations that the government has built spy networks within Australian universities to monitor Chinese students and their political views. This almost sounds very similar to how Russia is seen over here. It's almost... So with Russia, for example, I don't necessarily know how much we rely on Russia as the UK, um, but it's certainly... We hear about how the Russians are interfering with voting and, 
and things like that. So it almost seems similar, similar with you guys with China. In one instance, a Chinese student studying in Brisbane participated in a rally supporting the anti-Beijing protests in Hong Kong, and days later, the student's family back in China were visited by the authorities. There is a very clear but unspoken threat by China to Australia. Um, isn't there the story in the news at the moment about the tennis, the female tennis player who made a allegation of a Chinese higher up of, of sexual assault and went missing? Uh, apparently there was um, a video, she was on video or something uh, to say she's okay, but under what under what conditions is she currently being maybe she's being forced to say she's okay this is the scary thing about some of these countries um these these countries like china like russia who if you say the wrong thing you, you're so oppressed that if you say the wrong thing your family yourself you may be in serious problems we had the issue over here with russia in um in salisbury with uh, the guy that was uh, poisoned basically because spoke, they speak out about Putin. It's bad that these countries can do this. Uh, and like I said, it's bad for it. it. You know, I don't think the UK massively relies on Russia. I don't think. But when you're relying on a country like China with completely different views, it's got to be a little bit worrying in the back of your mind. If you make things difficult for us politically, we'll make things difficult for you economically. How things typically work in China is that in order to achieve business success, even when running a fully private company, one needs to be cozy with the Chinese Communist Party that runs the government. Therefore, even if a Chinese company is fully private, it knows that it needs to act in a way that aligns with China's politics. Mm. Of course, while some of China's tools of economic warfare are more traditional, like tariffs, a lot of its influence stems from the actions of the private sector. Any private Chinese company knows that if Australia suddenly took a hard pro Hong Kong independent stance, for example, the CCP might not be happy about continued business with the country. Australia is therefore in a tricky spot where it's a Western country. Uh, before it even says, the problem is, so it's like, for example, the UK has just done a trade deal with Australia and it's, and it's not great, is it? Let's be honest, because uh, if, if Australia was a little bit closer to the UK, brilliant. Um, but it is so far away. You know, that is Australia's problem. Australia is so far away from, let's be honest, the rest of the world that trade is difficult. So with, granted, it's not, China's not necessarily the closest country, but it is the biggest closest country that with, for trade. Um, if you fall out with them, who do you trade with? Who do you trade with? in the same sort of efficiency. I'm gonna be scratches all over me. Oh my God. Socially and politically, but in many ways, an Eastern country economically. As a result, taking a political stance against any actions by China comes at a much higher cost than that of a less economically linked country. Australia quite literally cannot afford to lose China. Mm. A trade war with China on the scale of the US's would devastate the Australian economy. China, no doubt, has done wonders for Australia. But the point is that too much reliance on any economy, no matter how strong that economy may be, is a risky strategy. When that strong economy is run by a foreign government that can adjust its flows in an instant, that's even riskier. According to one study run by the Reserve Bank of Australia, if China's GDP contracted by just 5%, that would result in Australia's GDP falling by 2.5%. Hmm. That is a clear-cut case of economic reliance. So, if Australia wants to keep up its unprecedented period of economic growth, irregardless of how China is doing, diversification is crucial. I know a lot of Wendover Productions viewers... There we go. We'll finish there. Um, I think the main issue you have now, then, is the distance. The, 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 your location, Australia's location in the world is the biggest issue you've got because as i said you know who do, who else do you trade with to the same to the same efficiency it's all well and good trading with the uk who let's be honest yes we've got what 60 odd million people um but we're a small country uh yes you've got america but they're not close um so everything will cost more 
uh, to trade because of the, for example, travel. Um, it's a tricky one. And, and as I said, because China have obviously vastly different views uh, to most of the rest of the world, um, it doesn't make things easy. I think Australia is in a real tough spot and I think you it's you have to almost you almost have to play along. You don't necessarily like it, but you have to play along. But that's not healthy. Um, tricky. What do you think about it? If you're from Australia, do you know how much of an influence China has on your country? Um, did you know about how many, the percentage of students for example let me know of your thoughts who else would you trade with and uh oh yeah don't forget to like and subscribe and i'll catch you next time